Good evening. As president of Grinnell College, I'm pleased to welcome you to the first presentation of the Grinnell College Young Innovator for Social Justice Prize. The Grinnell Prize was created by a passionate group representing our trustees, staff, alumni, and student body. As we begin the program, I thank each of you who helped make tonight possible, um, from those who first embraced the idea of a prize, to those who evaluated hundreds of nominees' applications, to those who handled the myriad details of this presentation. Uh, we stand here in the presence of some of the world's most remarkable young minds in innovative social change. We are pleased to recognize them and celebrate them, and it's fitting that we do so. Their passion for making the world a better place is clearly aligned with Grinnell's history, mission, and core beliefs, all of which are rooted in serving the common good. <clears throat> Helping our students prepare to change the world for the better is one of Grinnell's most indelible strengths. Grinnell began 165 years ago when some New Englanders with a strong bent for social reform came to Iowa and founded Iowa College in Davenport. A short time later, in 19, 1859, the college moved to Grinnell, which at the time was an important stop on the Underground Railroad. Grinnell College is now one of the great liberal arts colleges of this country, in no small part because of its underlying values. <clears throat> Our college's history is replete with examples of students and alumni working to affect positive social change. And I'll just give you three examples. One, Grinnell's social consciousness blossomed during Franklin D. Roosevelt's presidency when graduates such as Harry Hopkins became influential New Deal administrators. In 1961, a delegation of Grinnell students traveled to Washington to demonstrate in front of the White House in support of President Kennedy's proposed nuclear test ban treaty, an act that led to the beginning of the modern student peace movement. And even today, Grinnell has consistently ranked among the top colleges in deploying our graduates as Peace Corps volunteers. Grinnell is quite intentional about encouraging students to desire and seek positive social change. We integrate the pursuit of social justice into our classrooms, our curricula, and our lives. For example, Grinnell's Expanding Knowledge Initiative has introduced curricular innovations in the study of the environment and human rights and human dignity. Our Social Justice Action Group works to fight hunger, promote volunteerism, and build understanding. The Joseph F. Wall Alumni Service Awards offer some financial support to Grinnell alumni who engage in projects, programs, and organizations that are dedicated to improving the lives of others. Through our liberal arts in prison program, students, faculty, and staff engage imprisoned adults in liberal arts courses. And the Grinnell Corps gives graduating seniors the opportunity to work in education, conservation and anti-poverty pursuits in the United States, China, Lesotho, Thailand, and Namibia. Because our history and current work is steeped in the pursuit of social justice, it's fitting that we recognize those who are creating a better world by innovating and affecting social change, and that we encourage other young innovators to do the same this year, next year, and the year after that. Tonight, we honor four young innovators representing three organizations. Each is under the age of 40 and was selected from a pool of more than 1,000 nominations representing 66 countries and an incredible range of issues. Hunger relief, disaster relief and accountability, childhood education, economic development and the environment, urban agriculture, literacy, youth arts, fair housing, violence prevention, immigration, GLBTQ, restorative justice, health care, children's mental health, and global peace, just to name a few. This year's winners were chosen for their leadership, their creativity, their commitment, and their extraordinary accomplishment. They truly embody the college's mission to serve the common good, and they are inspiring examples, seeing a huge social need then working creatively to meet that need. 
Each winning entry receives $100,000. Half goes to the individual or individuals, and half to the organizations the winners designate in collaboration with the college. In total, Grinnell College is awarding $300,000 in prize monies this year. I am so incredibly impressed by our prize winners' vision, their creativity, and their leadership, and I think you will be as well. To introduce and confer the awards upon this year's winners are Laura Ferguson, class of 1990, who is on our Board of Trustees and served on this year's Grinnell Prize Selection Committee, and former Grinnell College President George Drake, class of 1956, who chaired the selection committee. Laura and George. Thank you, President Kington. I, too, am humbled to stand here tonight introducing you to four outstanding young innovators for social justice. On behalf of the Grinnell College Board of Trustees and as a member of the Grinnell College alumni, I would like to congratulate our winners and welcome all of our guests to campus. In addition to the $100,000 prize, former, former Grinnell College President George Drake will present each prize winner with a laurel, the emblem of Grinnell College and the traditional symbol of honor that is bestowed on great scholars, poets, and heroes. Tonight, Grinnell honors heroes in the fight for social justice. In addition, we'll present each one with an original oil painting by Tilly Woodward, Grinnell's curator of academic community outreach, outreach at Falconer Gallery. Tilly's work has been exhibited in nearly 200 museums and galleries nationwide, as well in, as in corporate and private collections. Her art has an uncanny ability to evoke emotions surrounding a specific issue. More about these particular works is available in your program. Now, I'm pleased to introduce you to our award winners. 37-year-old James Kofi Annan has lived through events most of us can't imagine. When he was six years old, his financially desperate parents sold him to child traffickers. For seven years, he worked long hours in the fishing industry of Ghana's Lake Volta, moving from one fishing village to another, never being paid, never learning to read or write until he escaped at age 13. He returned home, borrowed school books from kindergartners, and taught himself to read. To pay for food and school, he farmed, fished, and plugged mangoes and coconuts. Rainy season was tough. James' usual sources of income vanished, and he'd go house to house asking for menial tasks for pay. At times, he'd go for days without food. Even so, James ultimately earned his degree in psychology from the University of Ghana, a master's in communication and media studies from the University of Education in Ghana, and a job as a manager at Barclays Bank of Ghana. In 2003, James invested more than half of his income to found Challenging Heights and open an evening school, which helps motivate children to get an education and prevent their being enslaved. In 2006, he added a vocational school. In 2007, James began working with Challenging Heights full-time and opened a school in his hometown. Last year, he opened a school to serve the unique needs of nearly 400 rescued child slaves and other vulnerable children. Challenging Heights also teaches families and communities about their individual rights. It helps them find alternative sources of income, training, and other benefits that help keep families together. The organization is dismantling Ghana's child slave industry by mobilizing communities, pressuring local and national government, and introducing and helping implement new laws and policies that safeguard children. Soon, James will open a shelter for 60 rescued children where they'll get the love and support they need to transition back to their families and their communities. For his remarkable efforts to innovate and enact long-term change for Ghana's children, we are privileged to present tonight's first Grinnell Prize to James Kofi Annan.
Thank you very much. And uh, these are a few of the very humbling moments in my life when I have to stand on a platform like this and receive awards that um, I believe I receive on behalf of the numerous children that I am privileged to serve. It's interesting you know, sometimes how children allow you the opportunity to serve them, and by so doing, they open such doors for you, and you become heroes whilst they are so in their villages looking for small messes for a day. Uh, it's been a long time come. It's been several years of uh, perseverance, and I believe that this is another opportunity to tell the world that child slavery will end one day. Because with this award and with the resources that come with it and with the impact and the visibility in, in, in the communities and in the world, I believe that this opens another door for child slavery to end again. Uh, we know that slavery was eradicated several years ago. In our time, we have seen modern day slavery. And I believe that with this effort and with this solidarity, we will once again end slavery. Thank you very much for this honor. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has raged since before the State of Israel was created in 1948. Effort after effort to defuse tensions and violence have had little success. Enter 36-year-old Rabbi Melissa Weintraub, whose lifelong desire to provoke, promote human dignity and justice for marginalized populations led to the creation of Encounter, an organization that seeks seeding where others have failed. Here's how. While she was a Harvard University student and as a lifelong Zionist and peace builder, Melissa traveled to Israel to learn Hebrew. Despite all the barriers she faced as a young Jewish woman, she sought to understand Palestinian perspectives on the conflict. She was profoundly affected by what she learned and became convinced that the driving force of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was a basic information gap among decision makers. The vast majority of high-level American Jewish leaders have neither met a Palestinian face-to-face -face nor visited Palestinian areas of the West Bank. Melissa believed that if key Jew American Jewish leaders understood Palestinian perspectives, they would redirect their funding and advocacy efforts, which would have ripple effects on American and Israeli policymaking. After graduating, summa cum laude, with a degree in political theory and women's studies, she returned to Israel in 1998 to work as a Jewish Muslim engagement coordinator at an Israeli interfaith organization. Shortly after, she helped raise funds for more than a dozen Palestinian and Israeli peace organizations. Fast forward to 2005. Melissa, then a rabbinical student at Jewish Theological Cemetery, co-founded Encounter, an organization dedicating dedicated to giving American Jewish leaders personal, face-to-face -face exposure to Palestinian life. Today, Encounter represents the most significant non-military Jewish presence in the Palestinian areas of the West Bank. It also represents the most politically and religiously diverse group to ever participate in person-to-person -person efforts. To date, Encounter has brought more than 1,000 American Jewish leaders to the region, always in a way that emphasizes dialogue and civility among right and left-wing Jews as much as between Jews and Palestinians. In addition to co-leading Encounter, Melissa was ordained as a conservative Jewish rabbi in 2006 and has served as a rabbinic fellow in the conservative communities throughout North America. She's a noted speaker and educator, having taught in prestigious venues on four continents. To quote Jeremy Ben-Ami, president of the pro-Israel, pro-peace lobby, J Street, when the book about the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is written, Encounter will have a chapter. 
for her relentless and effective efforts to promote peace. We are pleased to present the Grinnell Prize to Rabbi Melissa Weintraub. I guess all of us are going to begin with our uh, tremendous humility in accepting uh, this prize. It's really quite um, overwhelming, and uh, I, it ha it's, it's not since my wedding that I've had a here comes the bride music and walked across <laughs> a stage. Um, well, really, we, we at Encounter were already uh, tremendously honored to be nominated um, and utterly stunned and overjoyed to be selected among so many extraordinary uh, leaders and organizations, and I don't envy the selection committee at all. Um, I, I think this recognition to encounter speaks to the dire importance, um, really the, the thirst in the face of today's radically polarized and rancorous political culture for a better way, for a different way of engaging profound conflict in ways that affirm the dignity and humanity of all parties involved for a way of bringing together ideologically opposed, diametrically opposed adversaries um, in, in ways that enable them to communicate and even to collaborate in addressing um, problems of passionate common concern. You, uh, you heard a, a bit about our work from, from Laura and, uh, and hopefully from, from some other sources as well, so I'll just um, paint a bit of a concrete picture of, of what we do. Imagine this. Orthodox and Reform rabbis, uh, lead supporters of arch nemesis Israel Lobby's APAC and J Street, um, uh, national religious settlers and anti-occupation activists, all sitting down together in front of the separation barrier with a Palestinian family directly impacted by it and grappling together with what it means with mutual listening and respect. Imagine Jewish funders of the Republican, Democrat, and Likud parties sleeping in Palestinian homes and staying up all night poring over maps and histories. Imagine Orthodox rabbinical students uh, praying their evening prayers in the homes of former Palestinian militants. Imagine leaders who had formerly only met on mutually demonizing op-ed pages, apologizing to each other for shutting each other down and imagining how they can um, actually engage in joint problem solving rather than political jockeying. I know not all of you are daily connected to internal Jewish communal dynamics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, so let me bring this home. This would be as if family values activists entered the homes of gay families to try to understand their lives better. As if pro-life and pro-choice activists sat down together to envision innovative, joint uh, um, projects and, and engagement and activism. Encounter alumni now represent the most influential leaders of American Jewish life and, as Laura said, the only civilian presence that thousands of Palestinians have known in their lifetimes. We've grown in just a few short years from an audacious rabbinical student dream um, into becoming uh, a force that's reshaping American Jewish involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and recognized by uh, high-level U.S. elected officials as a key missing ingredient in, um, in peace efforts. So this, this prize honors the unflagging encounter team and our brave alumni and the thousands of Palestinians who took a staggering risk on us and who have made real a vision of nonviolence, a vision of peace that's not just an absence of violence, but that's actually a living code that refuses to degrade any human being, but rather lifts up and advocates for everyone, Jew and Palestinian, right-winger and left-winger, perceived aggressors and victims. In the context of one of the most entrenched divisive conflicts of the modern era, 
This prize honors a paradigm that turns the logic of conflict on its head. No one is dehumanized or swept away. Everyone is worthy of empathy and of having their needs and concerns taken into account, those we sympathize with and those we don't. Um, this prize honors all peace builders and activists who are affirming all that's best and deepest in us and helping us shape our collective destiny in the direction of our greatest hopes rather than our greatest fears. So I, um, I really want to thank every uh, person in this room who I know worked tirelessly to make this night happen. I already feel like I know many of you and know what a special community Grinnell is. And um, Tilly, I want to thank you for the gorgeous painting. I feel like you saw right into the core of our work and captured it. Um, and uh, I'm really very touched by it. And I want to thank every person in this room for partnering with us, recognizing the importance and the uniqueness uh, of our vision and uh, helping to ensure that that uh, one day Israelis and Palestinians and all of us will know what it means to live in dignity and in peace. Thank you. When Robert K. Greenleaf coined the phrase student leadership in 1970, he defined a student leader as someone, a servant leader, as someone who is servant first, making sure that other people's highest priority needs are being met. What an apt description for Eric Glustrom and Boris Bulayev, tonight's final recipients of the Grinnell Prize. Eric and Boris are both Amherst College grads. Boris is 26 years old and Eric is 27. Both are helping prepare an entire generation of Ugandans to be leaders and entrepreneurs. They're doing this through their organization, Educate. As a high school student, Eric visited the Changwali refugee settlement in Uganda. He left with a burning desire to help refugees break free of poverty, social in injustice, and other bondages, and he knew education was the vehicle with which to do it. Inspired by one young refugee's intent potential, he started Educate to raise funds and to help refugees go to school. In its first year, three Ugandans benefited from Educate's scholarship program. Eric continued to operate Educate through his years at Amherst College, where he met Boris. Beginning in their sophomore year, they worked together to serve the highest priority needs of young Ugandans. Both Boris and Eric graduated in 2007, Eric with a degree in biochemistry and Boris in economics. That next summer, they focused on creating a curriculum for Educate that would extend the organization's reach beyond refugee camps and into schools. This program would teach young Ugandans leadership and entrepreneurial skills that would not only benefit the students personally, but would have a kind of ripple effect that would impact countless others. Integrating this program into schools meant navigating the complex web of domestic Ugandan ministerial politics and personalities. It required connecting with dozens of decision makers in government, non-governmental organizations, and the schools themselves. Eric and Boris tackled the challenge head on. Today, Educate employs 43 people who work with 1,400 students across Uganda. Students have already launched 415 business and community initiatives. These enterprises include a jewelry making cooperative for widows afflicted with HIV or AIDS, a microfinance organization that supports other student initiatives, a reforestation project, and the manufacture of high efficient stoves to reduce the nation's dependence on firewood and charcoal. In turn, these projects have had a direct positive impact on many thousands of individuals. Eric and Eric's and Boris's relentless desire to unlock the potential of African youth in order to solve problems of poverty, disease, and environmental degradation has had a tremendous impact. So much so that recently, the Ugandan Ministry of Education adopted the Educate Enter Enterprise curriculum into secondary schools throughout the nation. It's our privilege to introduce you to Educate's president, Eric Glustrom of Boulder, Colorado, and Educate's executive director, Boris Bulayev of New York.
Um, so they asked us to say some thank you remarks, and, and I think it was appropriate to start out with the story of how we found out that, that we were going to receive this prize. Um, I remember it was early one morning, and uh, well, we were supposed to have a phone interview with, with, um, with Melissa, and you know we thought it was the next round of interviews and whatnot, and, and Boris w was on the phone with her already and, and was waiting for me to get on the line, and we had prepared some, you know, our answers to what we thought might be the interview questions and whatnot. And, and then Melissa, uh, I get on the phone and the first thing I hear is, is Melissa saying something like, well, you know, Anna, we wanted to say congratulations on, on being selected as winners of the Grinnell Social Justice Prize and um, started to go on. And, and, and I think the first thing I said, I kind of interrupted her, I said, Melissa, I'm pretty sure you made a mistake. <laughs> and then Boris followed that one. <laughs> something along the lines, I think uh, you're joking. <laughs> um. And then uh, that day actually happened to be my birthday. Um, and so I asked again, are you joking? Um, but then it was true. Um, so I guess we're, we're incredibly honored by this. Um, still kind of in disbelief that we've won this, but uh, just trying to enjoy the ride. Um, it's been a real honor to be able to spend time with the Grinnell community. Um, I think... Uh, I think, I guess, our example shows what you can actually get done from a little college dorm room project, from a, do a dorm room nonprofit, as a, a, a term we coined today with uh, some Grinnell students. And um, I think it, being part of this community and seeing, um, sort of being able to experience what it stands for has been really remarkable. And uh, being able to talk, to talk to one student who had this amazing uh, business idea to um, to basically do advertisements um, through browsers to raise money for nonprofits, um, talk to the social entrepreneurship group, um, which is an uh, which will be educate size very soon, and um, it's really made me believe that the uh, eventually the the winner of this prize will be a Grinnell alum. So um, appreciate you guys inviting us in, and uh, it's truly an honor. Um, and I also wanted. To make sure to thank our team in Uganda. Um, you know, I, I think uh, oftentimes when we draw our organizational chart, we draw it upside down as to what you might con consider the standard organizational chart. And it's because our mentors, who are the ones who actually go into the schools and work with our students one-on-one -on -one, um, to help them start the projects and the businesses that lift themselves and their families and the communities out of poverty and solve the social and environmental challenges facing their communities, is those mentors who are really doing the real work of the organization and we're just really here to support them. Um, and and I, I say this with just complete honesty, that our team is really the ones that, that inspire me to continue to do this type of work. Um, because I see how much they believe in, in, in what we're doing and how much they believe in the potential of the next generation. Um, uh, and of course want to thank a lot of our students who also inspire me um, and, and continue to keep me um, going forwards. I really do think of them as hopefully the next James Kofi Annan of Uganda and our, our students from the DRC I hope will be the next Melissa um, Weintraubs of the DRC and, and trust me the DRC is a place that needs more Melissas. So um, you know have also been inspired by, by James and Melissa. Um, and, then, and then finally uh, you know they say partnerships are like marriages and that was never more true than we walked in those doors and heard the, the wedding music playing. Um, of course. Uh, <laughs> it was some weird alternate reality. I was like, are we getting married now? Or is this? It was kind of been a long day, too, so I just go with it. Um, and <laughs> this is the equivalent of the ring. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to thank Boris as well because... Uh, we, we just were having the same conversation with some students, but h how important it is to find the right people to work with and, and how, how, how sometimes, you know, having, you know, someone who thinks so differently than you is actually the most important and effective thing for the organization. Um, and, and so can't say enough how much I appreciate our, our, our partnership and what it's done for me, in terms of my own learning, my own growth, also what it's done for the organization and therefore the, the, the people that we're working with. 
Um, so, Boris, thank you. And, of course, thank you to Grinnell. This has been absolutely wonderful. I'm actually hoping that, that our college, Amherst College, will, will copy some of what you're doing here. Um, so I don't know if President Kington can work on Amherst to do some similar things over on that side. But it's proprietary. <laughs> I'll be carrying that information with me straight to Amherst College. Um, <laughs> uh, but, no, thank you very much to the Grinnell community, too. Well, tonight uh, we have met James Kofi Annan, Rabbi Melissa Weintraub, Eric Glustrom, and Boris Belayev. Incredible examples of young innovators who truly work for the common good. To learn even more about these advocates for social justice, you are invited to join us for the remainder of the Grinnell College Young Innovator for Social Justice Prize Symposium, which continues through Thursday. And I just want to add that I, I think you can see by the responses that we've heard tonight how important it is for our campus to meet these young people and how important it is to have the symposium that it will going on for the rest of this week. And you should all know that you are invited to the various activities that I will describe. The symposium is co-sponsored and organized by the Rosenfield Program of Public Affairs, International Relations, and Human Rights, and directed by my history colleague, uh, Sarah Purcell. And Sarah, would you please stand? <laughs> the remainder of the week's activities start tomorrow with coffee and conversation with all four prize winners at 2.30 in the Forum South Lounge. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Grinnell campus, the Forum is on the other side of this sort of square in the central campus. You also will have an opportunity to hear each prize winner speak, as well as Morris Dees, who is the founder of the Southern Poverty Law Center and this year's keynote presenter. All four presentations will occur right here in Herrick Chapel. And for those of us who are old timers, that's fun to say, right here in Herrick Chapel. And you won't want to miss them. Tomorrow at 4.15, James will deliver his presentation called Passion, Commitment, and Innovation, the Critical Success Factors in Community Project Sustainability. And later at 8.00, Eric and Boris will present why I quit the basketball team to join Educate, jumping in the deep end. On Thursday, Morris Dees will give the Scholar's Convocation titled With Justice for All at 11 here in this chapel. And at 4.15, Rabbi Wantribe will give her presentation called Authentic Peace Building a justice that is not just us. And to conclude the symposium, we'll gather at 5.30 in the Bucksbaum Rotunda. And again, that building, if you're unfamiliar with the campus, is also in this sort of rectangle of buildings in Central Campus, sort of that way. Uh, and there'll be a reception at 5.30 on Thursday afternoon. And you're all invited, and we look forward to seeing you there. Before we adjourn, I would like again to commend Laura Ferguson and the eight other members of the 2011 Grinnell Prize Selection Committee. It was a privilege for me to chair this committed group. Uh, and uh, there are members of the committee here, and if they would please stand. One is right here, M. Marcia Turnus is there. Would you please stand? And have I missed anybody else? Uh, Monica. Monica Chavez, 
And, and they're listed in the program, and you can see it's a sort of combination of Grinnell insiders and outsiders to the college. They were keeping us honest in this process. Um, I also want to particularly commend Melissa Chan. You saw Melissa sort of doing the grunt work back here, handing, out, handing us the uh, awards to give out. Melissa arrived last year late in uh, J January. Uh, we finished our work in the selection process in April. It was a daunting process, and believe me, none of us on the selection committee would have been willing to undertake this pro uh, process without Melissa. She somehow organized 150 people connected with Grinnell, alumni, faculty and staff, students, to do the first screening of the candidates. And then our committee had 50 finalists to look at so we could actually spend the time we needed to to make these wonderful selections that we've made today. So we particularly want to thank Melissa. Wherever you are, Melissa. And Melissa would be the first to tell you that she could not have accomplished this without Caroline Saxton, who was her assistant. Caroline, would you please stand? There were a th over a thousand nominations, as you have heard, and uh, we really are, appreciate the work of all the groups who, hand, who trimmed that to the 50 that we looked at. We want to particularly thank the Rosenfield Program and Sarah for their contribution to tonight and all during the week. It's, they're doing a lot of the organization. And then these wonderful paintings, and they are absolutely wonderful, and we advise you to come and look at them. Uh, you must have been wondering what was going on. We give and then we take. Uh, <laughs> then we hang them up. Well, they'll, they'll be here for you to view. Uh, and then, believe it or not, we're going to give them back. Uh, at the end of the symposium. This is sort of, you know, you've got to stick here and, and do this with us if you're going to get your, your painting. Uh, and Tilly Wordward is here. Tilly did those paintings. And Tilly, would you please stand? <laughs> and one last item. As chair of the selection committee, I want to express how enlightening, inspiring, and rewarding the process was from beginning to end. I genuinely look forward to doing it again in 2012 as we search for the second group of Grinnell Prize winners. If any students, alumni, faculty, or staff would like to participate in the process, I'd encourage you to uh, volunteer. You'll find all of the information you need on the prize website, which is Grinnell EDU Social Justice Prize, uh, one word. Also, to all the young innovators for just social justice around the globe and their supporters, and most of the nominations come to us by those supporters, nominations for the 2012 prize are still open. The deadline for submitting nominations is next month, November 14th. Thanks to our winners and their willingness to come to Grinnell and interact with our community. And I know how much that's going to mean to us, and already has. Uh, we look forward to all of these sym symposium events beginning tomorrow and running through Thursday. And then it's my pleasure to say good night. <laughs>